Okay, so we're just about to uh, begin an interview with uh, Roderick Guthrie. Uh, we are at uh, McGill University on November 12th, 2015. And the interviewer, as usual, will be William McCray. So, just to begin, could you please state your full name? My full name is Roderick Ian Lawrence Guthrie. And your age, please. I'm 74. And uh, uh, where were you born, actually? I was born in uh, England, Sutton Coalfield. My father was in the RAF, oh. and uh, so uh, that was Bomber Command there. So, yeah, I was born in the Midlands. What year? 1941. Okay. Oh, yeah. right, uh, right in the middle of it all. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well. Um, so as a... Um, as a child, what did uh, first of all was your dad always in the RAF? No, no, he he was a he was a, a teacher. He was a okay. he was a housemaster actually at uh, Bishop Vesey's Grammar School, okay. which was a nice school in 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 Sutton Coalfield, and uh, okay. that's where where we where we were. Yes. And uh, what did you uh, do as a child for as a child? Or pass the time? What were your interests? I, rem I remember, uh, well, I, I, my interests were, as a child, um, <laughs> I uh, was interested in trying to learn how to read, and that took until about four or five. And then uh, we went uh, to Cyprus then, th which was lovely, and I spent about four years there. And then I, uh, I came back as a chorister at Durham Cathedral, and that was a tough time. So I had a, 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 a that was a, a boarding school. So mm -hmm. so, I, seventeen week terms was a rather long time, but anyway, I, I survived that and then uh, went to Nottingham High School, which was a wonderful school. And uh, at Durham, I hadn't learned any anything about science really. So uh, I I also was interested in history. Okay. And I liked history very much. So so my my subjects were mainly on the art side until I went to Nottingham High and then um, then the Sputnik turned up here you know, and the first Sputnik turned up and I was fascinated by all that science side of things so uh, that's when I decided I'd abandon history and Latin and, and the, <laughs> the arts and move into uh, science. So, so I became a, 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 a scientist, and uh, so I, I left uh, school at the age of uh, 18, went to Imperial College, and... Uh, what was your uh, degree going to be? In metallurgy. Metal why, yeah, yeah. why a metallurgy right away? Because that's quite specific. A lot yeah, of it was, uh, it was. Uh, well, I, I figured out, well, metallurgy combines... Um, chemistry, it combines physics, mathematics, and um, I was playing with the idea of chemical engineering. Ke chemistry was out because there were so many chemists and, and I, I took the uh, precaution of looking at what, what, what you could expect after getting a chemistry degree and it wasn't very much. It was, everybody was doing chemistry and I thought, well, I'll, I'll narrow the competition down a bit. Uh, I was very interested in chemical engineering, but um, metals had a, a, an attraction for me because I, I'd been playing around with metals as a teenager. So uh, I used to make model ships and model aircraft, so I was, I was busy doing that, and so I, I was melting down lead uh, in, 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 in the house and things like that for keels for boats and things like that. So, and I was blowing up my leg I, uh, and I blow, blew up my knee in uh, when at the age of about 17 it was, it, and it was the first year sixth at Nottingham High and, uh, and the chemistry master had, a, had, a, had a, the prize essay and it was on metals because he'd met the Professor of Metallurgy at Nottingham, uh, at Nottingham University. So, so I had a lot of time to investigate metals in the library while I was still recovering from my leg, which was in plaster for about uh, 10 weeks. So, so of course, I, I managed to win, win that prize and became very interested in metals. So, 
So I looked at metallurgy and decided I wanted to go to London because London was a, a good spot. It was the time of the Beatles there. Yeah. So, and and all that sort of thing. So so we had a good time in London. It's happening. Yeah, it's a happening place. <laughs> um, so so it's funny because you, you mentioned you like metallurgy because it kind of embodies all the sciences. Yes. But at the same time, usually as a metallurgist, you'll, you'll become very specialized in a... In a one facet of metallurgy. So, so right away, were there specific classes or, or subjects that you really realized that you liked and that you were going to go into? Yes, yeah, that, that, that's that took me into my PhD basically because okay. I, I I did I did my um, my first degree and uh, I didn't really like the uh, the problem of. Uh, Doing these these little samples, these to, to and looking under microscopes, I found out that as as much more interested in in bulk things, in big big material, macroscopic, like your boats and planes, like <laughs> boats and planes and things that that work. So, so uh, I uh, so I decided that uh, I liked process metallurgy, and and that that immediately takes you into industry. So, if you if you're looking at processes. The best processes are in industry, so mm -hmm. so you so it takes you into industry, which is what I wanted to do when I when I graduated from from uh, Imperial, I wanted to go into industry, but uh, I got interviewed by um, Professor Williams, who was here, and Professor Williams said, uh, "Well, y you're coming as a postdoc, so I, I was coming as a postdoc to Canada," and he said, "Well." Can't you come as a staff member? I said no because uh, you're not giving me enough money because uh, <laughs> you're giving me ten thousand dollars as a postdoctoral fellow, and uh, you're only going to give me eight thousand four hundred as a, as, a, a, as a professor. Why would I want to do that? So he said, "Well, I'll, I'll make it up. I'll, I'll make it up to ten thousand. I said, "Well, I don't want to do any lectures. I, I just want to uh, do research." So he said, "Well, I, I'll write a letter to that effect." I never actually got the letter, but I agreed in the meantime to become a professor. So I came over with a job, and so I came to McGill as a professor. And uh, and what had your um, thesis been? My thesis was on um, uh, spherical cap bubbles in liquid metals. So I was sending up the, the you know these big gas bubbles. They look like mushrooms. Mm -hmm inverted mushrooms so so that I was sending up these bubbles in liquid silver I okay. built my own equipment it, and are you talking when it's uh, being heated in a ladle or no no I'm just talking no. about uh, I had a column yeah uh, a, a, a mnemonic uh, tube uh, and uh, and I put liquid uh, put silver in it yeah and uh, liquefied it heated it up mm. made the furnace and everything and uh, had a little cup at the bottom turned it over and uh, measured the mass transfer coefficients, how quickly the bubbles dissolved. Okay. So oxygen dissolves in silver, it's got a very high solubility. But anyway, I managed to get around that and figure it out and get some mass transfer coefficients. And mm. So that, 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 was, that was a big project and yeah, I, I did some good work there. I, d I did, uh, yeah, good research. So, um Coming to McGill was this. This was your first time in Canada, I assume. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, how did you find a? There was a big difference between um, McGill and Imperial, um, and if so, what what was that difference? Or uh, no, I I think basically McGill was a little bit behind the times, but it was it was uh, it was a good good university, and. Uh, yeah, the, the faculty club was was a place where you could meet a lot of people, and uh, there were quite a lot of people from Britain in, in, in at McGill. Yeah, it's, well, it, uh, it's Scottish always attracted well, yeah. uh, international yeah, students. Yeah, 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 quite a bit. So uh, yeah, so yeah, McGill was very good. It was very very nice. I I liked it, but I I still went out into industry. So right my away. Foot, right away. Okay. So so I went off. Uh, I think I went down to Atlas Stainless Steels the first summer uh, with uh, my wife and then uh, came back that fall and then I went down to DeFasco. I, w I went to Atomic Energy second, second year 
And then I went down to DeFasco in the third year and worked with uh, the people down there. You worked in the labs? Worked in, in the research department mm -hmm. okay. and also in, in, in the, f in the um, plant. Okay. I saw I worked in the plant and I went through the whole of uh, steel making there, iron making and steel making. My first year I was down working on the blast furnaces, putting uh, oil injection into furnaces. We were trying to see how much oil we could inject into furnaces to replace coke. Okay. Mm. So, so, uh, so you were both here and at DeFasco at the same time? Yes, Miguel yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you, uh, so you agreed not to teach, but did you end up teaching? Or? I ended up teaching, yeah. But the, uh, so I ended up teaching, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I did teach, yes. <laughs> How was that? It was good, it was yeah. good, it was, it was good. It was a bit, bit tough getting the first lectures off the ground, but, and, and I had to uh, change my marking system because they all failed. So, uh, so, so I had to improve that. You're one of those, but, uh, those profs. <laughs> one of those types. Yeah, not not very. <laughs> but I, I now I'm a very very nice prof. Now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, um, so throughout, uh, through how long did you work for DeFasco? Because I mean, you've worked for McGill throughout your career, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but DeFasco, um, how long did that last? It was about 25 years. Okay. Yeah. So 25 years of up and down. It, it got a bit hectic towards the end, and, and then we formed this center, the McGill Metals, Process, McGill Metals Processing Center. So, we, um, so that sort of took me away from being able to uh, spend a lot of time in one place. I also worked with Alcan as well. Okay. Alcan uh, in Kingston and also up in Arvida. So that that was getting a bit hectic, the whole thing. So, so I I finally became a proper professor, as Williams said, and uh, and g gave up that and opened was, up the center. It was hectic. Why? Just because of the, uh, the travel. travel. The travel okay, was, yeah. you know, I was coming back, talking to students here at the weekends, going back in the summertime and working full time there, and. Uh, it, it was great. I enjoyed it a lot, but but it was quite hectic. Yeah, for sure. But I learned a lot from industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and if you could, um, are there any big differences you could point out between industry and academia? Industry is much nicer, I think. Oh yeah. How <laughs> in, so? in a in, sense, in, what in sense? a sense, industry is nicer because because you, you're all working on the same page. So so you you. In in universities, one has to uh, not not work quite that way. If if you're going to advance in a university, I believe you have to uh, do your own research. Uh, this has changed actually in in recent history. So people are now doing a lot of collaborative work between themselves uh, at universities. So so they they're, they're doing teamwork here now. But in the past, I remember I, it was more um, more individual professors making their way, uh, and in industry, it was the same thing. But in industry, it was um, it, it, it was a collaborative approach. Mm -hmm. I found anyway. So I, I enjoyed my time in industry. I had a few people from industry also tell me the big difference they would often or difficulties as well they would encounter with them being from industry and then working with someone straight out of academia was that theoretically they had a lot of good ideas but they practically they didn't they didn't understand they didn't get it yeah yeah did, did, do you find that uh, that to be true that's true yes I think it's very true yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. now um, from from either side or both sides uh, were there any dysfunctional jobs throughout your career or projects even a dysfunctional job. Uh, uh, dysfunctional projects? No, I, I think I think it, it was all all successful. Um, dysfunctional personalities? Yes, Th there's a lot of those around, but uh, but that's not worth talking about. So, <laughs> so I won't talk about it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, not even not even like a environments or. Environments, a dysfunctional environment 
Oh, in terms of dysfunctional environment, um, not really. No, no where nothing. production was was bad or no. I I think uh, it was. Th they were very good in industry. They were great. Um, yeah, I, I mean, no, the the only no no, no nothing really. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, now, if we talk a bit about your um, your your work in the field. Um, you would. Uh, you've worked a lot on uh, horizontal single belt casting process. Could you yes, talk a bit yeah. about that? And and was that done in industry or academia or both? Uh, it was done uh, in industry and academia. So okay. so basically, uh, it started off back in 1987 when uh, Jock McKay. He yeah. was director of research. Have you have you yeah, interviewed yeah. him? Yeah. Okay, good. He so for Stelco. Yes, he was yeah. director of research at Stelco. So, mm -hmm. so Jock called together the steelmakers of Canada and said, "Okay, how are we going to make this, this, um, this steel uh, in the future? Because it looks like near neck shaped casting is going to be on 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 the books, and and maybe there's a better way of making steel than continuous casting machines with, with uh, molds that moving up and down." So. So I was tasked with the um, the problem of finding out what quality the steel had to be in order to have successful products, sheet products, um, with with a new continuous casting process. So I did that. I, I said what the temperature of the steel would have to be, da 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 da, all the technical stuff, and. Um, and I was working with uh, a chap called Joe Herbertson. He was my postdoc at the time. So Joe and I were, were also addressing the bigger question about what should the machine look like. And, um, and uh, the, they, they called the, the, the whole thing was called Projet Bessemer, which should have given me a clue at the time that they, they were focused on Bessemer casting, Bessemer twin roll casting. But uh, I, I, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about the, the, the way you put 100 tonnes per hour per metre width of uh, steel on, on, a, on, a, on how, how would you do it? And I came up with the idea of this horizontal single belt caster. And I called it horizontal single belt caster because it fits in with HSBC, which is the <laughs> Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. <laughs> but... but uh, but uh, so, but it turns out that um, it, it it's been a hard struggle since then. So so uh, first of all, the Canadians said no, no, that's not good. We, we, we're going to do a twin roll casting project. So that was okay. I, d I did work with them on twin roll casting. What, what would be the big difference from a uh, non metallurgist between your, the double and then and the single you were trying to develop? Oh uh, well, <laughs> it's it's one of productivity. Mm -hmm. The productivity of a twin roll caster is limited by the size of rolls you can have, and uh, the productivity of a belt caster is just determined by the length of belt you make. So, so, so I was projecting a belt of about 12 meters long, uh, which is about you know, 40 feet long. And then you can, you can cool down the, the, the liquid steel and have it freeze and uh, be fine. So, uh, so it, 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 in actual fact, there was a, my friend in Germany, uh, Professor Schwartfeger, he had the same idea at the same time, and um, so uh, so it didn't exist yet in in the world. It doesn't exist yet. Okay. It, it, we've got the first one now working okay. in in um, in uh, in Germany in Pine Pine, but but we had our individual machines working back in the nineteen um, eighty nineteen ninety, and. We, we, I, I, first of all, the Canadians weren't interested in it, so, uh, so I sent it out, I sent out a machine to, um, Australia, oh. to, uh, to Jeff Belton, who was director of research, he was an old Imperial College, uh, graduate, and so I, I knew Jeff as well, and Jeff, Jeff liked it, and he brought back, um, uh, 
Joe Herbertson, and uh, th they were casting steel on the belt caster in 1990. The belt caster was um, not... It, it didn't go too far because they were also doing a twin belt casting program. So, uh, so, so what happened was that uh, the, the, the horizontal single belt caster was, was running, but then it was stopped and they, the, the uh, management, the BHP head office said, you can't run two near net shape casting processes, you'll have to do just one. And we've got this agreement with IHI, uh, that's the, heavy, the um, a, a company out of Japan making the twin belt caster, okay. twin roll caster. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, so basically they, they said, uh, you've got to stop that work. I said, and so they stopped the work at, uh, in the research labs in Newcastle on the horizontal single belt caster. And carried on with the, uh, the the Project M, it was called. And uh, so Project M actually is now operational. It's the only twin belt casting operation in the world, I think, that is now viable. Maybe POSCO and, and Bow Steel have, uh, have some efforts going that way. But all the other companies have given up on twin Belt, twin roll casting uh, for various reasons, but um, BHP combined with uh, with um, Nucor in the states. Nucor's a uh, electric arc furnace company, so Nucor uh, Nucor uh, formed a, a, and BHP formed a, a, a company called Cast Strip, and Cast Strip is still operating. It's sort of uh, it's twelve years now. But it's it's certainly it's 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 a process that works. But it's a process that produces products which are good, and um, and and uh, the question is is what is the the um, what is the profitability in it? Uh, I think probably it's okay for Nucor, uh, but it's certainly not not the answer to to the problem about how to make clean steel sheet uh, suitable for autom automobiles and things mm -hmm. like that so so that um, that is still a target of this horizontal single belt casting process so um, so yeah so so what happened it's a long story I, I mean gee <laughs> but anyway so 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 what happened was that Joe became director of research and Joe said uh, would you like it back? I said, yeah, I'll take it back. And we were moving into the Wong building, so we, we, uh, we brought it back to McGill and worked on it. We got a big CFI grant for it, and, uh, and we were casting aluminum sheet material by 2005, I guess it was, when it, f when it was revamped, re re reworked, and uh, and then it worked until 2012, and then 2012, um, there was an incident in the um, in the foundry where we had a we, we had a thermite reaction between one of the students was uh, was using a grinding machine and uh, and the sparks were flying across, and uh, there was a, a small crucible about this size. And there were some some uh, some car some remains of the casting that uh, was in there from the day before, and the, the the hot iron oxide was going on the magnesium, mm. and um, and then that created a lot of smoke. It, it suddenly went off after about twenty minutes. It went off, and smoke filled the lab. And I guess we'd had one or two little accidents before that from various professors and uh, this time the 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 exhaust system wasn't working too well this is a long story to say we were kicked out of yeah. the hill <laughs> so we no so longer we could no longer work it yeah. so now it's now it's off campus and okay. i've got the machine re refitted and it's working off campus and, and my students now work off campus 
So, uh, so is the idea now to make it <coughs> to, to make it good enough so that it is uh, that so that it does make efficient um, sheet metal for uh, the automotive industry or. Yes, yeah, yeah. Still, yeah. okay. The, so so still the, the, target, that the target. The target is to do that, but but you can use uh, that casting process for for many other things as well. So so there's there's, there's endless possibilities, mm -hmm. I think, in in that that machine and that that technology. And do you have any idea why Canada was more leaning towards the twin uh, casting as opposed to the single? Because it was a new idea, and uh, and everybody thought of Bessemer's dream, and, and uh, Bessemer's idea, it, it works, uh, it works with BHP managed to make it work, but nobody else did. Uh, from uh, Nippon Steel were the first to make a twin belt, a twin roll caster, uh, and they 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 did two machines, and uh, it. Uh, neither worked it it, it, uh, it just wasn't competitive it uh, too many problems with the side dams with the the shape of the rolls you've got to make to to to, to get the the flatness it's very mm. very difficult uh, and um and the the gases being entrained uh, it, it, it and then catching the, the the stuff as it comes out it's it's a tricky process, but even when it's working well, that's good. But but the companies don't really tell you what the what the uh, uptime of a machine is. So so I think most of them were not able to uh, to make it profitable from a commercial point of view. Okay. So, but it looks as though we're hoping very much that this HSBC caster will 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 be the answer. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, There's 1.4 billion tons of steel cast per year, by the way, around the world. And it's all, at the moment, done by the 1960 Youngens process, Youngens and, and Rossi, which is the, the fixed mold moving up and down. And the, the quality of the steel on the surfaces is not good there, but you have reheat furnaces where, yeah. where you heat the whole thing up again, and and you you get rid of all these you slough off all mm. the the imperfections and so uh, that's that's a <laughs> you know beat it and you'll get it right and it'll work but and it then takes they more time it takes more time more money. And the money the 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 the, the infrastructure is massive I mean th this thing if if we can get it working is would be about a tenth the price really a tenth wow. of capital and operating. Wow. We can operate it with five people, say, and and that's from start to finish. So, so hopefully it'll it'll work. In the yeah, yeah. No, it's it's funny um, that so many of the technologies, you know, they got them right once, and they haven't changed. Yes, a lot of the yeah, yeah, yeah. machinery and the yeah, techniques. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you said yeah. 1960. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, well. 1954 actually. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, now you've uh, you've won uh, the Killam Prize for engineering in Canada for your work uh, on your work on having co-invented uh, the Limca process. So could you explain what that process is and, and how it works? Yeah, the Limca process. It's uh, I think I've got some. Only if I, oh, here's one. Th this is a Limca for steel. Th this is a. Uh, Basically, you you put you put this um, you put this into uh, liquid steel. It's it's all shrouded with cardboard and everything, and there's a steel cap at the bottom here. But the the guts of it is this this little thing here. It's a little tube, and there's a little hole, small hole here. You, you can hardly okay. see it. It's 500 microns, it's half a millimeter. Yeah. 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 So, so you you pull a vacuum on that, and and you suck up liquid steel into here, and uh, and then you know what the sample size is, and th this was made by Heraeus Electronite, um, and the uh, this this is the connection to the anode, and the cathode is 
a, a sheath of metal that comes on the outside and uh, basically you pass a, a heavy current from inside to outside heavy being about 24 amps exactly so if you put 24 amps DC through there then you can then when it, when an inclusion goes through that little hole there's a little rise in resistance a oh. delta R resistance and so so you can hook that up to uh, to uh, so, so, so you amplify the signal to millivolt range the trouble with this is that it's all microvolt ranges because the conductivity of liquid metals is so high so so the electrical conductivity is so high so so you got uh, you you're only got microvolt signals but the beauty about this is that you're creating microvolt signals in a sea of electrons so so you can see microvolt signals because it's it's ground state zero here so as long as you can catch that signal and amplify it quickly then then you've got a process so that that's basically the 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 concept of uh, the Limca process, liquid metal cleanliness analyzer, huh. but we use it in in the aluminum industry a lot, for um, w which is a bit a bigger thing and it's it's continuous. This is this is a a smaller a smaller example. Thing. So how many would you use in um, in in one testing of aluminum, for example? Well, in one testing, you'd use one per okay. per drop per aluminum drop. So okay. so you'd have. Uh, if, if you've got a furnace and you're tapping, it, it could be two hours of pouring of liquid aluminum into a DC casting rung. So, so you, you would, uh, you'd, it would last for two hours. So that, that was very, very uh, critical for Alcan to, uh, to improve their practices and, uh, and get qualified for, for making uh, aluminum sheet material for, uh, for the beverage can business. 30% uh, of the uh, beverage cans, 30% uh, of their their product went into beverage cans. So that, that they couldn't afford to say no to it. Yeah. So it took a long time to negotiate an agreement with them, but 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 they 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 I had some good people inside Alcan who who were supporting the idea. So uh, so uh, it worked. But there was a lot of resistance. It was not easy to get it out, but uh, all sorts of difficulties. But anyway, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this this next question is broader, um, but it's uh, it's it's about your opinion and, and, and what you think. In your opinion, are there any events, people, inventions, contributions, disasters, anything really whatsoever that that pop up that you deem must be mentioned when talking about the natural resource world in Canada. Well, uh, have you interviewed um, Professor Hugh McQueen? I have. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have because he he, he he knows about railways and yeah. bridges and <laughs> all that sort of. He's thing. a huge yeah. history buff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, just yeah. saw him at the um, Canadian uh, Science and Technology History Association conference. Oh, okay. Uh, good. 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 Okay. Weekend. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was, I'm glad you got got him. And uh, so, so what was the question again? So the, it's it's really a broad question. So it might sound like a tough question, but there's no wrong answers. It's if if when talking about the natural resource history, the natural resource world in Canada, is there anything that comes to your mind that you know? Oh, we're doing this oral history project. I think we should mention this name or this disaster or this invention. Well, I think that the whole disaster is is the the way. Um, I, I think there is a disaster in the sense that in the nineteen seventies, eighties, and nineties, everything was uh, Canadian and run by Canadians, and now it's it's uh, it's not run by Canada. It, even DeFasco, DeFasco got bought up for nothing because. They sold off the the Sherman mines and everything. So DeFasco had all these uh, mines, and and uh, ArcelorMittal came in, yeah. bought up DeFasco, gone. And uh, I mean, I still work with them, and uh, but it's uh, 
it's it's tough for those people really tough and Stelco that was a fine company and uh, yeah I talked to with yeah. Jacques about that yeah. yeah it's fine company it's, yeah. it's a real shame Inco Valet yeah yeah, yeah no so that's it's a, a disaster yeah that's I think quite recurring actually you're yeah. not the you're not the first at all to uh, to no. mention that and uh, yeah it's a, a very big shift in yeah in the Canadian natural resources yeah okay. Thank you. Um, maybe a few um, s more social questions, but one I, I ask almost every time, and that's women. Throughout your career, and it might have changed, but how absent or present have women be? Have women been in uh, and interesting here in academia and also in industry? Um, I, th I think we, we've always had about. We've always had women coming through, and, and they tend to be very good. And uh, some of the best miners, mining engineers, were, were women. Uh, so, uh, and we don't have so many in this this particular class uh, that's coming through. But, uh, but I, I think normally it's running about twenty to thirty, okay, thirty percent, something like that. So it's it's it's. There is a place for women, and uh, in in metallurgy for sure. And uh, in industry, was that uh, in, in industry? And has well, that changed? You worked twenty five years, so maybe yeah, you yeah, might have seen it, a. Yeah, there seem to be a, a good number of women there. Uh, um, of course, they get married and and that sort of thing, which is, but. Um, in the steel making area and the, the, the and the the blast furnaces it was all men mm -hmm. and uh, basically there were recent immigrants m many of them who, who worked on the on the hot metal side of things but uh, it's it's a hard job and uh, but uh, in the labs the the women have got places and in physical metallurgy that that sort of thing in material science the, there's the, it's it's more it's less one sided yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah less one sided so i think we, women are, are okay they, they do fine i think and have you seen it increase at all or stay the same or i th i think it's uh, i think i it has increased a bit Fr from my day as a student i think we had i think we had one one girl in Three years. So in the three years we were <laughs> there, there was one girl, and uh, and uh, and that was it. Out of how many? Out of uh, probably about uh, two hundred. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's increased. A bit. <laughs> it's increased a bit. Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, and another another question would be. And and again, good perspective here because you've worked in academia and. Um, industry but do you believe there's a disconnect between uh, the natural resource world or, or these industries and the general public and if so why I, 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 I don't know that there's such a well I, I know DeFasco and DeFasco was uh, they were very into um, to uh, Local events. I mean, they were sponsoring all sorts of things. That the Alcan, the same thing. They're sponsoring all sorts of uh, interactions with the public. Say the the, the concerts here in, in mm -hmm. uh, supported by Alcan. Um, so I, I I think that that they've always been very good citizens. I mean, uh, in the past, in hundred hundred and fifty years ago. It would be a natural conversation about how the blast furnace was doing and having a belly ache and, and that sort of thing. And they, people don't know about that anymore. Yeah. But they do know that uh, they do know about uh, the steel industry, at least in the in the towns where they're operating. And uh, and I think uh, they have a reasonably positive view of it. Oh, maybe some people in 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 the public think it's a dirty business but it's not really it's a very high-tech business and uh, it, it is dirty it can be dirty but uh, but it's very high-tech okay. 
we say it's a smokestack industry, but uh, or a, it's a sunset not, industry. A sun, uh, that is, mining that is a load of garbage. Yeah, <laughs> it's a total load of garbage put so. forward by su some some people who, who who should know better that uh, that uh, it's a sunset industry. It's it's it's. Uh, it's going through hard times at the moment, the steel industry, and so is, so is the aluminum industry, but um, mm -hmm. it's uh, It seems important. to be a recurring theme, though. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's uh, cyclical. It all, yeah, they're all yeah. cyclical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any, yeah. any mineral, any metal, any, yeah. Um, if, just a few last questions, and this one, um, again, no wrong answer, but sometimes people find it tough, but what are you proudest of in life? And we can split it up. We can also say proudest of professionally and then proudest of in general? Uh, well, well, I'm not very... I, I don't have much pride, actually, <laughs> so... so I, I, I... What do you believe uh, has... What's the most successful part of your life, then? If someone was outside looking in? Negotiating universities, I guess. Getting through a university in one piece. Okay. Yeah. Meaning? <laughs> Me meaning, <laughs> I'm still here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, one last question, which would be, if you were speaking to someone much younger, like yes, myself, like or, yourself, uh, yeah, or a yeah. student, um, right. what, what would be the, an important life lesson or piece of advice you would give them, whether about their future or their careers or... I, I would think to to be as good as you can be, and 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 not to to. Uh, I suppose really, basically, to if if you're really in, involved in enjoying the job, then do it. If you're not, get out, and 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 find something that that really appeals to you. Well, what you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to you'd like to add or or share? No, not really. I think uh, it's Canada's been a good place, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Good.